Psalm 12, as we continue our series through the book of Psalms. And this one here I titled, my, this is my title, Talk, 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 because there's lots of talk going on. And again, it has a title. And this, well, the scriptural title is For the Choir Director Upon the Eight String Lyre, a Psalm of David. Every one of the Psalms we've covered so far has been a Psalm of David with the exception of one that has no title. That may or may not have been a Psalm of David. But this one is because it's, like I said, these titles are part of scripture. So verse one, verse two, help Lord for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. The true greatness of a country is its morality. The true greatness of a man is his integrity. The godly man ceases to be. Now all of us have been around for a while and we can kind of see that a lot of changes that have taken place in our own society, in our own surroundings. And we remember when it used to be this way, that there was more and more people that actually attended church and there was more and more of that out in the community and slowly on it's kind of eroding away. Now, Europe started that much further back than America did. In Europe, because the, it's a lot older churches and you have these huge cathedrals that are still there. But on a Sunday, you might have a cathedral that seats three to 500 people and there's three to five people. And then somehow or another, it just continues. It continues to be there. And it's just totally ignored anymore. The society just has no recognition of God. Now, they're not saying that they're a bunch of atheists, because they do believe in a God. The problem is, it's a God instead of the God. And there's where we have to be careful when we talk with people and have this concept of, well, yeah, they believe, but it makes a difference what they believe. Just believing in God, it doesn't really mean anything. But believing in the one true God, gives us a responsibility. And that's where the difference comes in. See, we can believe in a God, and that means we're believing a God that fits what we want that God to be like. And that, so the control of my life is myself, instead of the God who must be in control of my life. Verse two, this, they speak falsehood to one another, with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. It is commonplace anymore for people to tell other people basically lies. And those lies are told over and over again, and it goes back and forth to where eventually those lies are accepted as truth. So back and forth they speak. Okay, with flattering lips and a double heart. Flattering lips, they speak things to make you feel good, make you, you know, all, all of the self-help stuff out there that can help you lift up and find fulfillment in yourself. Double heart, there's a double motive. And the motive generally is for the person that's putting it out there for self. It's not, they say this, and they might even have convinced themselves what they're doing is good but it's not for the help of the person. It is for the help of themselves. Selfishness is a huge factor in our lives if we're not careful, because we look at everything through the lens of how does this affect me? That's a danger. We all fall into it. I fall into it, believe me, as much as anybody. But in my own head, I'm justifying it this way, but the reality of it is I'm justifying it because it fits for me. Instead of it fits for the way of the other person or, what, or the country or whatever, I'm looking at it, how does that affect me? So I can take it and twist it around a little bit so that it's, I'm a little bit more on the plus side. Well, that, that's, a, that's an interesting synopsis, um, but maybe and maybe not always true. 
I mean, have to justify is maybe, maybe the way to term it so that if I have to, that means I have a problem with it. But if I do justify what I'm doing, how am I justifying it? Right. So that can be either which way. So the have to part, I would agree with you with, with that in the statement. Because we see it, and you've heard that term, fake news misleading information, false narratives. These have been around for a long time. This is not something new to our generation, like, oh, you know, back if you go back a number of years and that didn't happen. It's always been happening, okay? It's just the, the methodology has changed. The reality hasn't. It's always been a problem. You see the picture. Should be a picture on the screen. Verse 3. May the Lord out of all, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, flatteries and disingenuous talk. Now that's a pretty strong statement because if you look at it carefully, it says, may God cut off the lips and cut out the tongue of those that are doing this, that speak great things. Those great things are not as we would think great things, but great things for self flattering and disingenuous talk. The, all that here again, you know, that concept of I'm going to speak what you want to hear so that you like what I'm saying, which means in turn, you will like me. It's all about self, okay? Yeah, it's, it's speaking, instead of truth, it's just speaking out what is comfortable. Verse four. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? Now, that is an interesting thing when we look at it from our concept of freedom of speech. We hold that in really high regard in this country, the right to speak publicly whatever I want. I mean, there are a few little limitations, but overall, that whole concept of freedom of speech is, in, is a really a big deal and important and good. But when it's used with the flattering lips, the double heart, the self-preservation, the self-lifting up, all of these things, then it becomes controlling. And when it becomes controlling, then it becomes a case of, now I have power over you. So my mind has been working on how I'm going to frame the narrative so that I can now control you. So back to self again. Because people say, well, I mean, I have the right to speak. I have the right, the freedom of speech um, that, that's there. So who's going to tell me what I can and cannot say? Do you know that most times throughout history when there has been, um, and we can do even use recent history of uh, riots, do you know how many people it takes to incite a riot? One. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You've got, you've, got, you, you've got this whole group that are getting all fired up and then somebody has figured out if I get up and say this set of words and do these things and scream and holler in this way, I will have control over this entire mob. And they do. And that's all it takes. So that fits perfectly in what David is saying here. Who is the Lord over us? Well, actually, in a, in a mob situation, the leader of the mob is Lord over you. You're, you're not there willingly. You think you are, but you're not. You're doing these things you think it's because you have the right to or you decided to. No. Somebody took over control of you is what happened. George C. Parker, the most convincing American who ever lived, once or twice a week for several years, Parker convinced people he owned the Brooklyn Bridge. After they believed him, he'd sell it to them. His buyers would usually discover the swindle when the police arrested them for putting up toll barriers on their bridge. Now, I, was, I read that first time. I thought, is that the, I mean, I've heard, you know, I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. That's been a saying for a long time. Was the true history behind it? And this is actually the true history behind it. There was a guy who was a swindler and was really, really good at it. He has actually managed to sell that bridge more than once in a week. 
and he got somewhere between four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for it. He also sold a number of monuments. Um, he sold great uh, um, um, Grant's tomb. Um, there, there was a whole series of things that he did. But what he, he was really good at is getting people to believe him. And of course, that was back in, you know, before the internet or being able to do any quick research. And, and he normally preyed upon immigrants that had just come over from Europe to America. And here was, you know, America is a place where, you know, anything can happen. Oh, the most wonderful things, there's riches galore, and you can accomplish all of these things. That's what they were told which is true in a sense, but so they come, but they're a bit gullible, they really don't know, and he would pick them out, and he'd pick them off, one after another. These people are still around today. We now get them in our cell phone calls. They have all these wonderful things for us. They're swindlers. Verse 5, because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the gro groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in safety for which he longs. See, all through this, we've been looking at the terrible side of it, but now God steps in. He says, because I hear you. You're suffering. I, I hear you. And, and now I will step in and help you. I will provide for what you truly need. Verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Now, number seven in the Bible quite often is the number of completeness. Okay, so, um, and, and it does fit in this description, and we're going to look at that refining here a lot deeper here in a minute. Verse 8, the wicked strout about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are vile and proud. We see that again. And what is vile? It's the state or quality of being utterly evil. So when I say that, utterly evil, who pops into your head? Who else? People. No, okay. No, that's a good example. Um, you know. Well, Putin, um, Hitler. Uh, yeah, Hitler's one. Um, see, we, that's who pops into our head. But we live in a world that is full of evil and vile men and women, for they are praised. And quite often they are. But the worst, the absolute worst of the worst of vile men and women are in the church. Now, does that make sense? See, we think of evil, wicked as killing and, you know, and all of these terrible things. That pales in comparison. Because the worst are in the church, for there the brokenhearted and troubled come to rest. But what they are given are tasks and demands. Looking to be fed, they become feed. See, when people come into the church, they come in there with the concept of, I'm coming to, for hope. I'm coming for redemption. I'm coming for forgiveness. I'm coming for peace. I'm coming for a better quality of life in my mind. I'm, I'm coming there because this is my last hope. This is the only place I can go where I can learn about this great and wonderful God and all the things that he can do for me. And then these evil, evil people, they take him in and they rob him of all of it. They just put a bunch of demands on them. Well, you have to do this, this, and this. And of course, you gotta do a little giving too, you know, and, and maybe a little bit more giving. And the more giving you do, the more blessed you'll become because it's more blessed to give and receive. And they start quoting scripture and they bring them in and they literally are destroying souls. That's far worse. That's far worse than destroying the body. So that's why I lay this out as the the most evil and vile people are in the church. You know, last night somebody had said, of the church we came from in Georgia, she said that they started going to Heatherwood because 
their mother was newly divorced and they were the only church that welcomed a newly divorced woman with two young kids. And I'm thinking, how sad, you know, that was back in the 80s, but yep. still, how did you do that? Yeah. Well, the churches don't want sin in the church. That's well, the that's what you have to <laughs> But the problem is, is we don't, churches don't want sin in their church. They want everything to be perfect. Well, that's not perfect. demands to be fully accepted, and we don't feel. Okay, now, now let me play the other side and, and, and see what's, if this actually makes sense on the thinking. Not that I agree with, but on the thinking. Okay, now that you don't want these people in the church that have committed these horrible sins because they're going to influence the other people in the congregation then maybe they will because if they're accepted then the other people in the congregation are going to feel as though well I can do this and still be accepted See, do you see the the twisting of words in the mindset? See, I'm doing exactly what I was warning about as far as using flattering words. Okay? So that fit perfectly in what we, like I said, we were just talking about, giving you kind of an example of it. Now, because somebody comes into the congregation that has had this sin in their life, and is looking for forgiveness and acceptance, you might say, in the house of God, this is what they need to get. Not, you know, condemnation, um, you know, I might say, not beating down, not shunned, um, and the people in the congregation should not come anyway with the mindset, well, well, what they did is okay because they were accepted. They were not accepted because of their sin. They were accepted because they want to be a child of God. That's why we accept them. So the idea that, well, I can go do this too and be fine, um, that has to be beat down immediately. That, that shouldn't make any sense but you can twist it around to make it look like it actually is, has logic to it. And then you have the most dangerous and vile people, I still say, are in the church. Yeah, what is your purpose here? Why are you here? Are you here, you might say, to fulfill your obligation for the week? Are you here because um, this is what you're supposed to do? Or are we here because we want to fellowship with each other and learn from each other and grow with each other, but a growth that brings us closer to our God? So that then in turn that has an impact on my daily life and no longer am I a Christian on Sundays only, but I'm learning how to be a Christian every day of the week and every waking moment. This is what I'm striving for. And I can't do that if I'm not willing to put forth any effort on my own. Because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen in anything else, but it doesn't mean that we're working for salvation. We're working towards growth. And we're working towards a better relationship with our God. Silver refined. This is how silver is refined. Remember we looked at that silver refined seven times? And we're going to look at it, how that, what that actually means. Starting with, with ore is crushed. Then a fire is kindled to the proper temperature. The crushed ore is placed in a crucible. And the, the ore heats up and silver becomes a liquid. And the impurities of the ore can be scraped off, called the dross. Although out of the process it must be constantly watched as silver is too valuable to be left alone. A little charcoal is added. This prevents it from reabsorbing oxygen that would dull its finish. As time goes by, more impurities arise and are scraped off again. The refiner looks at the crucible, seeing a dim um, reflection of himself. The heat and its effect continue. More impurities rise to the surface, and again, they scrape them off. Letting the fire cool, the silver hardens. But once more, he lights a new fire, hotter than before, placing the crucible back in the heat. More impurities surface that must be scraped off. As he once more looks into the crucible, his face is much clearer, but still not clear. In Daniel 12, verse 10, 
Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in a furnace of affliction. Zechariah 13, verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refining them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Now let's look at silver refined again. And instead of silver refined, this is me and the refiner is God. And you look at it from that perspective and suddenly it, the meaning totally changes. Starting with or being crushed, until I'm crushed and made nothing, I can't come before God. Then a fire is kindled to the proper temperature. The fire is kindled in me just to the point that it needs to be. God has determined that. The crushed ore is placed into the crucible, so I'm placed into the fire. As the ore heats up, the silver becomes liquid. As I heat up in my faith and my commitment, I become more pliable to God's will. As the ore heats up, the silver liquid and the impurities of the ore can be scraped off. The dross, the sinful parts of me slowly and are being scraped away as I'm being purified. Through the process, it must be consistently watched. God is always watching over me. The silver is too valuable to be left alone. God says, you're too valuable for me to just leave you. I will always be with you. A little charcoal is added. This prevents the absorbing of the oxygen that would dull its finish. A little of the spirit is added. A little more of the spirit is added because this keeps it pure. This gives us guidance. This helps. As time goes by, more impurities rise and are again scraped off. As I go through my Christian walk, more and more impurities are taken away. More and more am I being molded into the image of my God. The refiner looks into the crucible, seeing a dim reflection of itself. You notice that the refiner that looks into the crucible, God himself looks in there and he sees the person a little bit coming a little bit more like him. The heat is, and its effect continue. More impurities rise to the surface and again he scrapes them off. Again, more and more impurities are taken away. Letting the fire cool, the silver hardens. Okay, God backing off a little bit. Letting us take that step. He's given us all of this help. He's given us all of this guidance. He's provided all of these things. Now he's going to test us again. How strong are you? How ready are you? But once more, he lights a new fire, hotter than before. In other words, the testing and the trials are now going to come back in a stronger way. Because we haven't obtained what we need to obtain yet. God knows this, but he also knows that he has to, I shouldn't say has to, but will for, let us go a certain point. But then he comes back. He doesn't really leave us. Placing the crucible back in the heat, more impurities surface that must be scraped off. See, we thought we had obtained that point to where I can now do it. And God says, no, you didn't. I'm putting you back in the fire. I got more impurities to take off. As once he looks more in the crucible, his face is much clearer. It's clearer. He's looking at us. He's clearer. He sees us conforming more and more to the image of God, but we're not there yet. More heat and time passes. Looking once more, he sees clear reflection of who he is. The impurities are gone. Now we have become fully in the body of Christ because we have now left this world. And now the reflection of us is the reflection of Jesus himself. Silver refined seven times. Back to verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. So as we go through the refiner's fire, this is what's happening.